Josh from Multiversity here on this lovely Friday morning with David Liss. How are you doing, sir? I'm all right. How are you doing? I'm doing quite all right. How was uh, your traveling to the con? Uneventful, which is all I really want. Yeah. I, I wish I could say the same. So, starting off with Black Panther, you just began a new, uh, or rather a single issue uh, with Francisco Fangarilla tying into Spider Island. Um, what was it? I'm assuming that uh, the Spider Island event was kind of sprawling in, in the books that it touched and it wasn't exactly the responsibilities of the writer, but how did you decide that you wanted uh, T'Challa to have six arms? It was actually kind of decided for me. We, uh, Marvel wanted to do a bunch of covers that were homages to Amazing Spider-Man covers, and my editor, Bill Roseman, wanted to do Amazing Spider-Man 102, and so he said, can you work with this? And I thought the idea of T'Challa having six arms was fantastic, so that's what I did. I, I started from there and figured out uh, what kind of story I wanted to tell, and rather than trying to tell a little chapter of the Spider Island story, I made it a standalone, but also leading into the next Black Panther arc. It's actually um, kind of interesting that the modus uh, for the entire issue was the cover. That seems uh, that's very interesting to me. It might, it might sound a little bit like the cart driving the horse, but you know, I think it's. It's not so different from starting from the premise of we want to do a tie-in, um, or we want to do a story in which character X is, you know, uh, suffering from problem Y. Uh, so, you know, I think there are a lot of times in comic books where you can have a really cool cover, and what's on the cover doesn't represent what's in the comic book. And one of the things we talked about doing was having the homage cover, but not really reflecting that in the book. And as a reader, I always hated that. If I see a six-armed T'Challa on the cover, I sure as hell want to see a six-armed T'Challa in the book. And so rather than just using that as a, as a, a kind of thematic motif, I, I decided that I wanted to actually have him have six arms and, and play that out. So it's not, it's less of an artificial constraint than it is a, a creative starting point. So kind of starting from the middle and now working backwards, uh, you had a long history uh, in the novel world before you moved into comics. And what has it been like making that transition? In many ways it's difficult because I'm writing in a much more confined space. Uh, in a comic book you have a limited number of pages and a limited number of panels per page and it's a much more visual medium so there was definitely a learning curve. Uh, but I think anytime you learn how to tell a story in a different way it helps your ability to tell stories in any way. And I've always loved comics so it's, it's been a real thrill to actually get a handle on that. And now that I've become much more comfortable with scripting and I do it more fluidly and I don't sit down with every issue as I did at the beginning saying how the hell do I do this, but rather just launch it and start doing it. Um, it's, it's become great, so it's something I really enjoy now, and it's part of my, my regular writing routine, and I no longer see it as a, something supplemental, but as part of what I do as a writer. It must have been convenient to kind of begin uh, your comics career with the Phantom Reporter, a writer, a uh, character that makes a stock and trade in writing. Uh, well, it was not only not only for that reason, but because it was a character nobody cared about. <laughs> I, was, I, I didn't have to worry about a whole, uh, uh, you know, huge amount of continuity. I didn't have to worry about getting things wrong. Uh, it was a, it was a very easy transition into the world of comics to to, to write my first issue as a as a one shot for uh, in a, for for a minor character. Uh, much easier than I think if you're coming in without having done comics to do something like the Hulk with a you know a huge uh, a backstory and continuity. I cared about the Phantom Reporter. I like the Twelve. <laughs> I like the Twelve too. So I, perhaps I overspoke, but certainly before the Twelve, nobody really cared about the Phantom Reporter. That is true for many, many, many years. Um, so, kind of, it, it's. Uh, it was. I read in the back of Mystery Men that this was actually uh, a project that was pitched to you before Black Panther. What was it like? Uh, yet, yet, Mystery Men came out after Black Panther did. So. Uh, what was it like having that long of a lead time on the book? Did you feel like it allowed you to work out some of the kinks in your in your process? Uh, I didn't have a long lead time in terms of getting the scripts in, so it was it was still on a, a, a pretty normal, rigorous schedule of trying to get a script a month done, as you do for most books. Um, the it, it was it was you know it took a little bit longer to, to hit the stands than I would have liked, 
but everything about it came together in a way that I love that I really in the end couldn't complain I mean I thought you know Patrick did such an amazing job with the art I think I really I know I'm biased but I think it's one of the best looking books out there um, you know Andy Troy did such an amazing job with the colors uh, everything about the book just came out the way it, it, I wanted to in my imagination and for that to happen it's you know it, it was worth the wait how did you go about developing the characters for that book because each of them while seeming to have their own voice was also very much entrenched in the world of pulp storytelling. Well, uh, Bill Roseman, the editor, and I, we had several conversations about what kinds of characters we wanted to have, and we, and we hashed out a bunch of ideas. And one thing that I felt very strongly about was that if we're writing about this first generation of people to put on costumes and fight urban crime, they had to have a good reason for putting on costumes. That, uh, so we wanted some of their costumes to be organic. Like, uh, you know, so one of the things we talked about was a clown, which we didn't end up going with. But, uh, so the surgeon came out of that, and, and the revenue a former stage magician came out of that. Um, so we, and we were also very committed to hitting certain kinds of pulp archetypes. You know, so we knew from the beginning we wanted somebody with a jetpack, and you know, we wanted somebody who was sort of a shadow-like figure. And uh, we originally thought of uh, the operative as a, a kind of. Uh, you know, pulp era strongman type character. Uh, so, so you know, we began by talking about what thematically we wanted and what archetypally we wanted, and then we just you know hashed out certain characters until they felt right. So, it, not only with Mr. Very obviously with Mystery Man, but also with Black Panther, you're very you seem to be taking a lot of influence from early pulp and crime stories. In your opinion, what do you think the impact of those stories and their relationship to comics is? I mean, comics do a lot of things, and you can tell a lot of kinds of stories. Uh, you know, it's, it's a mode of storytelling, it's not a type of storytelling. And, but for me, I've always really liked certain aspects of early comics and pulp stories, which are, rather than big, sweeping global events, guys in dark alleys fighting, fighting bad guys. There's something really primal about that, and something really satisfying about that. And I like reading those kinds of stories, and I like writing them. So uh, when, when the Black Panther concept was pitched to me, for example, um, the idea of Black Panther becoming this you know, sort of dark alley loner was just, just really appealing to me. And, and, and so that's what I ran with. Uh, so you know, for me, it just presses the, the kinds of storytelling buttons, storytelling buttons that I like. Had you been a fan of the Black Panther before you took over the book? Uh, I, I read a lot of Black Panther. I, I wouldn't say he was my number one favorite character, but I but I knew him and I liked him. Uh, I was surprised when 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 I was offered the character because it seemed a little bit out of, of my uh, wheelhouse at the time. But one of the cool things about it is you 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 learn that all of these characters have been around for a while for a reason. That there's always something really interesting, and compelling about them, and your job as a writer is to figure it out and exploit it. Uh, it Reading the book, it seems like it very easily could have spiraled into a traditional fish-out-of-water story. However, you really kind of weaved it into a story of redemption and of personal strength. And I'm just wondering what kind of informed the decision to go with that route. Well, I thought a lot about where the character was when the story was starting and, and the fact that he's, he's now... He is now a fish out of water. He's in Hell's Kitchen. He's, he's abdicated his throne. He's separated himself from his wealth. And I, I wanted all of this to make sense. And I wanted, you know, storytelling is about character and character is about change. So I wanted it to have a trajectory. And I wanted him to be much less comfortable at the beginning and have him become more comfortable, more confident, and more of himself, his older self, as, as the series went on. So he's been going through a transition lately where he's decided he doesn't need to be a loner. He doesn't need to do things uh, Daredevil's way. He can do things the Black Panther way and still be successful at it. It's, it's actually a little ironic that uh, now that the book has rebranded away from the Daredevil terminology into the most dangerous man alive, that now he's fighting the Kingpin and a more traditional Daredevil villain. But uh, what has it been like moving from um, a villain like uh, Vlad the Impaler, who you created, to Craven the Hunter, not explicitly a Daredevil villain, to very much the Daredevil sandbox with uh, T'Challa? Yeah, you know, we knew from the beginning that if T'Challa's hanging out in Hell's Kitchen fighting crime, at some point he's going to have to have a conflict with Kingpin. Uh, but we didn't want to do it right away, because we didn't want to make it, uh, 
you know, a, a daredevil story with somebody else's costume. And that's why we started with a fresh villain and we wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, it's really, you know, I, it's always really exciting to take these long-standing characters and, and do stuff with them that, I mean, that I hope will have some kind of real emotional impact on the reader that, uh, this is going to be a rough book for, 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 for Kingpin, and people are going to suffer in, in this story. And, and I think, you know, I've, I've been given a certain amount of freedom to, to, to play around with characters, and, I, and hopefully it's going to work out in interesting ways. Moving forward, uh, you seem that you bring a lot of your political attitude into the books, be it your addressing of uh, hate in America with the hate monger arc and fear itself arc, but also in Mystery Men you talked a lot about class disparity. What value do you feel, or rather, what value do you feel comics have to promote ideas like that? I think comics have value in promoting any kinds of, of, of ideas that the writer wants to bring to it. Uh, you know, my novels are fairly political. My, most of my historical fiction is about key moments in the history of, of economics, and I'm, I'm very upfront about what my take is on, on these subjects. And, and I'm a little more guarded in, in the comics because they're not my characters. I don't own them in the same way that, uh, that I own the characters in my novel. And I'm speaking for a publisher with when I write for Marvel in a way that I'm not speaking for, say, Random House when I write novels. Uh, but that said, you know, any story in which you can express an opinion of, of any kind of social or political or, or cultural matter, I don't see why you shouldn't. And the characters who live in this in, in their fictional world live in a complicated world just as we do. And they're going to encounter problems and they're going to have opinions about them. And to set your comic books in a, on a kind of like white soundstage in which nothing comes in or out but, but the you know, two, two guys in costumes fighting each other seems to me really boring. So what can we be expecting from David List both in, uh, both in the Black Panther world and also will we be seeing the Mystery Man again? Uh, I sure hope we'll be seeing Mystery Men again. Everybody buy the trade paperback and the hardcover when it comes out. Uh, we need sales in order to encourage them to uh, encourage Marvel to, to produce more more Mystery Men. The critics really treated us very well, but sales were not great. Uh, I would love to go back to these characters, do some kind of sequel or spin-off or something. Uh, as far as Black Panther goes, as you will see at the end of the next arc, there's there's going to be some very big changes, and so I can't talk about anything that happens after that other than things will be different. Uh, and I'll be doing uh, the spider for Dynamite in the spring. Well, thank you very much, sir. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah,